Okay, hello guys. And today we are looking at, at a topic um, called the arms race. So yesterday we looked at the space race, today we're looking at the arms race. Now that is obviously um, not actually what I've got behind me. Um, two great arms, one from America, one from the USSR, fighting it out, having an arm wrestle. It's not actually anything to do with arms. It is about the build up of weapons. Um, you know, we might term it an armory, all the weapons that we have as a nation, our defense, our, uh, our ability to attack. So an arms race is when two countries compete to build powerful and numerous weapons. Arms races have occurred before, notably um, Germany and Great Britain in the build up to World War I. They both developed um, dreadnoughts and had a naval race. However, with the Cold War into the 1950s, um, we see the development of nuclear weapons and this changes everything okay so the arms race in the cold war is significantly more threatening uh, not only just to the usa and the ussr but the entire world um seriously more threatened than we've ever been before because of an arms race okay so it is going to be competition who has the most strength a bit like the metaphor of the um wrestling or the arm wrestling and that's today's topic Okay, some key definitions that we need to know um, before we can move forward. And if I just make sure I'm out of the way. Right, arms race, just explained it, but a key definition for you to write down, two countries competing to build more powerful and numerous weapons, just like I've got up here. Um, the next key term that we'll come to later in the lesson, mutually assured destruction, or we might term it as MAD in the short term. This is where nuclear war would have been so devastating that neither side would risk starting one. So when both sides have the ability to cause nuclear war, when both sides have the ability that if one strikes the other, before that strike has happened, the other side is able to strike back. So both sides will get destroyed, mutually assured. That's when we have a situation where any kind of conflict is going to be hugely significant in terms of world safety. And finally, brinkmanship, um, the practice of trying to achieve an advantage by pushing a dangerous policy to the edge or the brink of conflict. Now, we might um, use an example of this that, you know, in the 1950s and onwards, any moment of tension in this Cold War risked and, and brought the risk and the fear of nuclear war. So anything they were doing, we were almost always on the brink. This idea of pushing it all the way to the risk point where we could actually start a Cold War. So that's the idea of brinkmanship. And these are kind of three very key definitions that we're going to use throughout this lesson. Right, in much the same way as the space race, it was, you know, a competition for these kind of significant milestones. The arms race is very, very similar. Which country can be the first to demonstrate power, technology um, and strength in certain developments, technological developments in terms of the arms that each weapon has? So this all starts in 1945. We know the USA, America uses the first atomic bomb, nuclear bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki as their um, move to end World War II. Uh, Japan surrender one week after that. So it is um, effective in achieving what America want them to do. Each weapon that they use has the power of 15,000 TNT. That's how we might describe the power of a weapon. So hugely powerful, nothing like nothing the world's ever seen before. And that's in 1945. So America at this point have the upper hand, they have the atomic bomb, the USSR don't. Um, from this moment, the USSR start their development and in 1949, they managed to successfully develop their own atomic bomb. So it takes them four years essentially to catch up. Um, 1945 America, 1949 the USSR. America works this out as they fly, they're flying over Kazakhstan and they see the USSR um, testing this bomb. Now this plunges the USA into a strategic crisis. What do we do? You know, we were, had the upper hand, we had the power to destroy a country just by dropping a bomb and we were the only country in the world to have that. So we really had a significant upper hand on a global stage at the end of, well, from 1945, the end of World War II. And now the USSR have this as well. 
Now, we've seen recently, you know, crises have happened in recent years, the last kind of decade or two, all over the idea of trying to get nuclear weapons out of hands where people think countries might misuse them. Think about America in this situation. They're sat there and they are worried that the USSR have this bomb. We've seen Stalin, you know, maybe make some slightly reckless decisions, influence democracy, not really play by, um, you know, a fair, a fair, or exactly play, you know, in a fair way with some countries in Europe, in the world. And America are seriously worried at this point. So they start and put into rapid process trying to develop the next bomb. Right, spurred on, stimulated by the USSR's creation of the atomic bomb to match their own, America wants to go one step further. And in 1952, they developed the hydrogen bomb. Now, what a hydrogen bomb is, is it is a rapid release of energy during nuclear fission um, using isotopes of hydrogen. So it's, it's very much more powerful than the atomic bomb that they used in Japan, 2,500 times more powerful to be precise. Um, however, developing the bomb is the first step. Before you can use the bomb, you need to develop a long range aircraft that can travel and drop this bomb. So they were, you know, they did very, very well to develop the bomb, the hydrogen bomb, but America can't actually use it yet um, until they've developed an aeroplane that can travel unfueled, um, long distances, a long range bomber to drop the bomb. And so later that same year, America developed the B-52 bomber, um, which can fly 6,000 miles without refueling, and it can carry the hydrogen bomb. So they can now actually use the hydrogen bomb. The USSR at this point do not have a hydrogen bomb or a bomber. Okay, one year later, the USSR catch up and they develop their hydrogen bomb in 1953. Remember though, they cannot use this until they develop a, an airplane, a long range bomber to drop it. And it is three years later in 1956 that they managed to do this. They call this the TU 95. Um, and effectively, now we're both at the same point again. So, this whole journey is like this you know, America developed something, the USSR developed the same thing. Up we go until, and every time we're equal, essentially both sides can cause the same amount of damage. So, with the development of this long range bomber by the USSR, both sides now have the ability to fly a plane and drop a highly powerful explosive bomb on each other. When we reach this time, they can both effectively destroy each other in a matter of hours. And this is where the path of the arms race starts to change slightly and we go down a slightly different route. So both countries have the same level of kind of firepower. They can both fly over each other and drop these hydrogen bombs and cause huge mass destruction. So there's a big paranoia and fear surrounding that. But as you know, this arms race has kind of been America in the lead and the USSR catching up. Now think back to the space race, it was quite the opposite. The USSR were absolutely ahead most of the time. Now is the moment where the arms race coincides with the space race. And I talked about this slightly in the space race um, lesson we did yesterday, and I'm going to explore it slightly more now. So in 1957, as we know, the USSR developed the Sputnik 1, which was that satellite, that man-made satellite that could go into space. Um, and it lasted for a matter of hours before the batteries died. While this was officially for peace purposes, peaceful purposes, um, this does start this very real paranoia that rocket technology can now be adapted and used um, to drop nuclear weapons or to fly missiles. And we know that's absolutely correct, this fear, because as we know later on, the International Ballistic Missile is developed um, ICBMs. Now, this was in 57. As you know, one year later in 58, America create the same thing. They now have the same ability in space as well as on land. And this kind of marks a point where the arms race, both sides have the same. So we're kind of in this, in this kind of lock ahead situation where both sides have huge amounts of te technology, both on the ground and in space. And both of them are absolutely able to destroy the other within a matter of seconds. Um, neither side is significantly more powerful. Neither side have you know, any, anything significantly different to the other. So we're kind of playing a balancing act here. They both know they should be fearful of the other, but they both know they're also about equal. 
So at this point in the arms race, it's about not about having more than the other side have in terms of new developments because we know they're both equal but it's about having um you know the size and the amount of the weapons rather than new developments now at this stage we call this first strike capability striking the enemy before they can retaliate you know it's like if you knew if you know that you're effectively as um fit and strong as somebody who who you might have to fight against. It's about getting the first punch in before they can punch you and you're on the defensive. We both have the same, so whoever really strikes first is the one that's going to win. And we call that first strike capability. You win the nuclear war by striking a city before they can strike you, okay? So that's what it was. And that's what creates, I guess, this kind of tension all the time over who's going to strike first. Okay, so I just wanted to give you the definition there of our first strike, cap first strike capability, striking the enemy before they can retaliate, striking a city before they can hit you effectively. Um, and this leads us into the second phase of this Cold War arms race. We have this, we know this exists, but it made people start to think, and it especially made leaders of these two countries start to think, can we develop a second strike capability? Can we develop the technology or the power or the you know, strategy that even if they try to hit us first, before we are destroyed, before we can, you know, completely be annihilated into nothingness, can we release or have, can we have the technology to release weapons back to them? So therefore we'd both be harmed and any action would always come with a reaction. You know, can I develop a situation where I have the, the knowledge to know they've released a nuclear missile at me and before that nuclear missile hits my city I can release one back and then at least they know that if they punch me they're going to get punched before um, you know before I, I, I fall and, and fall to pieces I guess um, so that second strike capability and that's the next phase of this Cold War now in 1960, the US developed what we call the Polaris submarine, and this really signals um, the breakthrough in that race for second strike capability. The submarine obviously is under the water in unknown locations anywhere in the world, in any of the world's oceans or seas. Um, the submarine carries, carries 16 missiles, and each missile has four warheads. Now, if you look at this missile I've got here, uh, the warhead is this bit at the top. And if you think about it as the missile is the vehicle and the warhead is the destroyer, the bit that actually causes the problem. Okay, so huge, vast, extensive um, nuclear resources on this submarine, definitely enough to destroy cities and, and you know, potentially even, even the whole country if you really wanted to. The Soviets now knew that if they launched a nuclear attack on the US mainland, the US could strike back. In, with their unknown submarines somewhere in the world. And it wouldn't matter if the entirety of, the, of America is destroyed. These submarines from their in, undisclosed locations can shoot their missiles and can destroy the USSR. Now, this guarantees the destruction of the enemy, even if you're the one that's been hit first. And this signals a point in the war which is so advanced in terms of threats that the entire world could be destroyed that phrase we learned at the beginning, the mutually assured destruction, when that we've now reached that point. But actually, and interestingly, this is kind of what signals a new and more peaceful period of this arms race. So this is called second strike capability. Um, the idea of, you know, if, if America is hit, they can hit the USSR back, regardless of being the one that was hit first. Now, the Soviets launched their own version of the same submarine in 1961. So at this point, we really have reached MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. It's impossible for either side to win because if they destroy the other, they know they're gonna get destroyed by the submarine, okay? So we now have a situation where we, we've almost been brought about a stagnation. We can't go forward anymore because if we do anything, and what's the point of developing, you know, even bigger and better bombs, we can't use them, because if we use them, we're going to destroy ourselves, because they'll hit us with their hidden and unknown submarines. Not only does this draw in the USA, the USSR, obviously, into this kind of world of threat, 
but the entire world is is now feeling this especially places like great britain um europe kind of sitting in the middle of these two places many of these destructive bombs had the power to really create kind of big 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 waves of impact um and it kind of produces a, a kind of a really a very real paranoia and fear especially going in the seven, into the 70s about the state of this nuclear cold war um, tomorrow we're going to look at popular reaction in a bit more detail but for the moment we're just going to have a very last look at some numbers just to kind of bring this together so i'm going to move out the way slightly so you've got your two definitions there first strike capability second strike capability um, this was the point of we, we want to strike them first, we want to develop big, bigger and better bombs, we want to be the ones that have the most power and the most resources. When we reach second strike capability, we know that whatever we do to them, they can do to us before we get destroyed or after we get destroyed from hidden submarines. So by this point, we have mutually assured destruction and really the risk of anyone actually doing anything goes away. Um, but it's also massively heightened because if somebody does make a mistake, then the whole world can technically be blown up by these two um, and their second strike capabilities. Right, I wanted to give you some numbers here. So I've got the NATO, this is in um, 1981, and I've got for you some figures about NATO and about the Warsaw Pact um, in different areas. So we've got bombers, ICBMs, inter-ballistic missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, troops, tanks, and artillery. Have a look at those numbers. I've put down the side the flag of the country who has the most strength in that area. Um, you know, you might want to pause the video now and make a couple of notes about this. But as you can see, we're quite closely matched in most things. The USSR definitely has, you know, some superior power in some senses. Um, think about, you know, the purpose of the Warsaw Pact for the USSR, using it as a way to kind of legitimately take control of these other nations' armies. Um, for the sake of defence and things like that, the defence of a lot, the defence of alliance, as they term it. Um, but I'm just going to leave that there for you for the moment. Just have a look at the numbers that we've got. Okay, so by 1986, it is estimated that there are 40,000 nuclear warheads um, that have been produced by the USA and the USSR. Now, this is equivalent to one million Hiroshima bombs. So the power and destruction that was un, un, unleashed <coughs> when Hiroshima was bombed with that one nuclear bomb in 1945, we now effectively have a million of those. So in terms of tomorrow, when we look at popular reaction and this idea of you know, the ban the bomb campaign and um, nuclear disarmament, it's a very, very real threat. Huge and huge amounts of this kind of nuclear fission power exists in between these two countries. In 1986, we really have reached a point where there's just so much of it, it's almost it's almost silly, isn't it? You know, we know we have second straight capability, we know we have mutually assured destruction, nobody's really going to use this, but up until this point, we're still producing it. We still want to have more and more and more, um, and both sides are still trying to threaten the other in terms of their kind of nuclear power. So one million Hiroshima bombs are now or the effective equivalent power of one million Hiroshima bombs are now in ownership by these two sides. Okay, we're starting to see kind of the, the ending, the relaxation of this Cold War. And one of the reasons, sorry, the arms race in the Cold War, one of the reasons for this is it becomes increasingly difficult for the USSR to keep up. Um, the USA are spending huge amounts of money on their defense. They start with 178 billion and it, in 1981, and by 1986, they are spending $367 billion on their defense program and their arms, you know, increasing arms and their nuclear weapons. That is a huge amount of money. The USSR faced much greater financial problems. Um, you know, the country as a whole are facing much more issues in terms of hunger, poverty. And it just becomes a situation where actually the USSR need to start funneling this money back into the people of Russia, um, trying to increase livelihoods, et cetera, rather than spending it all on defense. So by 1987, the USSR is effectively bankrupt um, by this arms race. It's basically bankrupted their whole country to try and keep up in the way they did with, with America this whole time. This signals a point where the leaders of the USSR want to end this arms race. And they're really invested 
in trying to kind of negotiate and calm down the situation. And really, that's kind of where we end when we look at the arms race. So the point of bankruptcy, 1987, is what really signals an end to the arms race. Okay, the last thing I want to go over with you is just why this is so important. So as with everything that we do in this course, we need to think about what impact this has on the rest of the events, the timeline that we have. You know, why does this matter? Why does it, why does the arms race actually heighten the tension or change other events that are happening simultaneously? And there are kind of three main ones where nuclear weapons and arms become very, very important and almost trigger, um, you know, will quite literally bring about the idea of brinkmanship. We're taking it to the brink, we're taking it to the edge. And in these three situations, nuclear war is risked um, to, you know, to quite an arguable extent. Now, the first one's in 1948. Now, the Berlin blockade, when Stalin blocks off those road entrances to the western sectors of Berlin and effectively tries to kind of pressurize to push the uh, western leaders to, to give up Berlin to, to the Soviets. Now, Stalin knows that America has nuclear intelligence by this point. They've just, you know, a couple of years earlier, they dropped the bomb on Japan. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So he knows they have these bombs. Um, he doesn't maybe know if they have other bombs of the same type, but he knows that they definitely have the technology to create them. He is bargaining here and he is playing very dangerously with fire, um, assuming that they're not going to use this bomb. He's correct. Um, America obviously don't choose to use the bomb. They clearly don't want to use a bomb, but they could very easily at this point have bombed the USSR um, and the USSR do not have the nuclear weapons to retaliate or even threaten a retaliation. So the Berlin blockade, we can say when we're thinking about why that caused tension, well, yes, it did almost cause a war. Um, if, for example, the USA had decided to attack the blockade posts, if the USSR had shot down one of the carrier planes in Operation Vittles, bringing in the food and the fuel, that could have sparked conflict. But even more so, it, it showed an, um, an opportunity for brinkmanship and it could have triggered a nuclear conflict between the USA and the USSR. The second example is the Korean War in 1950, um, going on to 1953. Now, if you remember, General MacArthur, when the UN troops are brought in, wants to push all the way back into China. He repeatedly calls for the use of the bomb against North Korea and China. He clearly wants to, you know, really destroy that ideology of communism. And it's actually Truman and the American leadership who are very strong in kind of um, knowing the dangers <coughs> of doing this and, and reeling him in as such. You know, he gets relieved of his command. He's replaced as leader. And the reason for this, now we have all the pieces, we can connect all the dots, is that by this point in 1949, the USSR had developed their own atomic bomb. So actually, if America had used the bomb in Korea or against China, then the USSR could have retaliated against America. So that also helps in explaining why in Korea they kind of reel it in and they don't push so hard in terms of taking back that North Korean territory. They use the idea of containment, containing it as it is, trying to keep South Korea um, non-communist, but not pushing, pushing, pushing back and trying to you know, destroy the communism on the other hand, because they're clearly worried about that first strike capability that the USSR now have the potential for. Lastly, and it's something which we haven't talked about yet, but we will do, is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now in 1961, this is the point where nuclear war is most likely to happen. Um, and it is hugely tense, and it's hugely likely. And actually, I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail here because we haven't learned about this topic yet. But this is what kind of signals a real end to the, um, to the real conflict of the arms race. Because after the Cuban Missile Crisis, because both sides saw how near we came, they actually install a direct phone line between the Kremlin, we've got Khrushchev here, um, and Washington. Kennedy is, is the US Prime Minister at the time, President, sorry, at the time. They install that phone line and promote kind of greater communication, better communication between the two sides. It also leads into a point where they start to disarm and they start to take down, take away some of those nuclear weapons they've, they've um, created. So that is, um, in summary, the arms race.
Um, I've gone through all of the different events in the timeline. Uh, we've talked about why it was kind of so important and where it's heightened tension in our course. So now if you were asked about any of these things in terms of why they cause tension, you can bring in the arms race, you can bring in the threat of either first strike or second strike capability, mutually assured destruction, use the terminology of brinkmanship, um, and hopefully you've understood everything.